introduce Patricia Nelson, who will be serving as our Spanish interpreter today. In a moment, you will see a globe icon pop up and you'll be asked to select which language you prefer. Please select the English or Spanish audio feed to hear the program in your preferred, in your preferred language. Welcome, Patricia. Do you have more instructions for us? Buenos días a todos. Yo soy Patricia. Voy a servir como intérprete esta mañana. Si usted prefiere uh, escuchar el programa en español, va a haber un, un, ahorita un globito que va a estar en su pantalla. Así puede seleccionar la, el idioma donde usted esté más cómodo. Y también si gustaría pasar de un idioma al otro, también es posible. Um, just repeating the instructions um, that Beth just gave, if you guys would like um, to listen in Spanish, um, as well as letting you know you can toggle back and forth in between languages. Great, thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, today's topic is Medicare for All, is it, is, it, is it in our future? Hosted by our local legislators, Senator Joanne Janal, Representative Kathy Kipp, Representative Andrew Basenecker, Representative Mary Young, and Representative, Representative Judy Amabile. And we are very fortunate to have three excellent panel, panelists to discuss this very important topic. T.R. Reed, who is a member of the Colorado Healthcare Cost Analysis Task Force, and also serves as chairman of the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare. Dr. Corey Carroll, who is a family medicine physician here in Fort Collins, and also Dr. John Bender, who's a family med medicine physician in Fort Collins also. My name is Beth Jager, and I will be your moderator for the next 60 minutes. We will have a very brief welcome by our legislators, and then Mr. Reed, Dr. Carroll, and Dr. Bender will present their remarks. We will then open the session for your questions and comments about today's uh, topic. And you'll be able to offer those in one of two ways. You can either click on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type in your question. Or if you prefer to ask your question live, then click on the reaction button. Within that, you'll see a raised hand function that's embedded in there. Click on that, I will see your a virtual hand, I will call on you. I will ask you to unmute yourself and introduce yourself. And then after your question is answered, please remember to go back on mute so we can eliminate background noise. And then one final request, please be sure to ask your questions and offer your comments in a respectful manner so we can have a very productive conversation today. Thank you so much. With that, let's begin with brief welcome remarks by our elected officials. Representative Kip, would you like to begin? Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say thank you everybody for joining us today. We are really fortunate. We thought we were going to be on the house floor today, the, um, all the representatives here, but we are here and with you and thrilled to be so. We have um, essentially, this is day 102 of our 120 day session. Things are fast and furious at the Capitol. We'll be doing a wrap up session on May 14th, but let's just get to our panelists. I'm anxious to hear the big conversation today. Thank you. Representative Basenecker. Well, thank you, Beth, and uh, uh, thank you to our panelists for making the time today for what is sure to be an exciting and I think really an informative conversation. And I just want to say thank you to all of the physicians and healthcare professionals that are on this call. I know it has been an immensely challenging couple of years, and we are deeply um, in your debt for all of the care that you provided to folks in our community. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Representative Young? Thank you everyone for being here today to talk about a very important topic. And I, I too want to thank all the healthcare providers that are on the call today. As a Medicare recipient, I'm very curious to hear this conversation. Um, so glad so many of you are joining us today. Thank you. Representative Amabile. Hi everybody, I'm Judy Amabile and I represent House District 13. And um, it's an honor to be here and to be part of this group of incredible legislators and uh, also to be here to share this information with all these um, experts and people who know how we can fix our healthcare system. So thank you. Thank you. 
Senator Janal. Uh, thank you, Beth, and thanks everybody <clears throat> for being here. Uh, and thanks to our panelists for taking uh, the time to uh, explain uh, uh, this issue with all of us. And uh, briefly, I just want to say that we all want access to affordable health care. My goal in the legislature and for all three of our panelists, and I think everybody on this call, is to improve the quality and access for all Coloradans. And it has been and always will be my number one concern that I've focused on at the state capitol uh, for about a decade now. And um, we've made progress, but there's a lot more to do. The question today is, can Medicare for All work in Colorado? It is truly an honor to have our three panelists, distinguished panelists today. I have or currently have worked with all three of these wonderful people in, on healthcare issues. T.R. Reed, T.R. and I have served on a healthcare cost analysis task force, or as I uh, call it, the 1176 task force. Um, for over two years, we meet every other Friday. I kind of miss you, TR. It's yeah, been I know it was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, as mentioned, TR is also on the uh, also been studying comprehensive healthcare systems around the world for decades as well for a long time. I shouldn't say decades, but probably that's true. So um, TR is also on the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare. Dr. Corey Carroll. Dr. Carroll has been a family pra practice physician in Fort Collins since the early 90s. And he is very involved with our community, with his patients. He's been past president of the Colorado, Northern Colorado Medical Society and the board of directors on the Colorado Medical Society. He frequently serves as doctor of the day down at the Capitol and is one of my go-to docs on healthcare legislation. Dr. John Bender is also one of Fort Collins' primary care physicians. I believe he's been practicing uh, over two decades, if not longer than that. Uh, Dr. Bender, Dr. Bender is also past president of the Colorado Medical Society, uh, also part of the Northern Colorado Individual Practice Association, past president, but also a member of the Northern Colorado Medical Society. Both our docs are extremely involved in this community in healthcare. Dr. Bender and I have brought forth legislation that passed in Colorado, number one, the first in Colorado for telehealth. And that was when not many people were using telehealth. Thank you, Dr. Bender, for that piece of legislation that has really made a remarkable difference. Also, uh, with Dr. Bender's help and, and direction, we brought forth uh, direct primary care, another very successful first in the state of Colorado. And I thank you for that. Um, he, like Dr. Carroll, is one of my go-to physicians when I have uh, bills that come up in regards to uh, healthcare in, that are coming forth in the legislature. Their two opinions uh, on what these bills are like and uh, what they will do and the unintended consequences is what, what I, I like in my discussions with them. I thank them both and T.R. Reed for being here today and being panelists. Thank you. And now I'm going to bring it back to Beth to start the forum. Thank you. I'm going to add on to Senator Janal's remarks um, to add to the uh, introductions to our three distinguished panelists. T.R. Reed is one of the nation's best known reporters through his books and articles, his documentary films, his reporting for the Washington Post, and his lighthearted commentaries on NPR's Morning Edition. Mr. Reed majored in classics at Princeton University and subsequently worked as a naval officer during the Vietnam War. He also is a lawyer, a teacher, and had performed many other jobs. He, uh, he is the chair of the board of the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, a $90 million operation that serves tens of thousands of Coloradans who are down on their luck. He has served as Kai Cho or president of the Japan American Society of Colorado. He is chairman of the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare, which, the, which is a statewide citizens campaign working for universal healthcare coverage. 
He has served on the boards of Princeton University and several other community and national organizations and the state of Colorado's task force on healthcare costs. Our second panelist is Dr. Coral, Corey Carroll, who is a board certified family physician who is currently in a solo direct primary care practice right here in Fort Collins. Dr. Carroll's goal is to help his patients stay as healthy and functional as possible. He says a hint is that it matters what you eat and to partner with them with what he calls successful maturation. Prior to medical school, Dr. Carroll was an engineer in the US Air Force. After serving six and a half years, he started his endeavor into medicine at the University of Cincinnati Medical School in 1985. Shortly after starting practice seven years later, it was clear that the current healthcare system in the US was just dysfunctional for both Dr. Dr. Carroll and his patients. A large amount of his time was spent helping his patients navigate the, this dysfunction and determine if they could even afford the, the, the care that they needed. When one compares the medical outcome data from the US to countries that have universal healthcare, Dr. Carroll believes that we should embrace a similar model. Our third panelist today is Dr. John Bender, who is an MBA, a board certified family medicine physician, a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians, and the senior partner and chief executive officer at Miramont Wellness Centers right here again in Fort Collins. Dr. Bender completed three years of service on the board of the American Academy of Family Physicians and is the past president of the Colorado Medical Society, past president and past chair of the Colorado Academy of Family Physicians, and a past president of the Northern Colorado Individual Practice Association. As Senator Janal indicated, he frequently serves as doctor of the day at the Colorado State Capitol testifies on bills in almost every session, and has worked on various pieces of legislation that are now law in our state, including those dealing with telehealth, immunization registries, the corporate practice of medicine, and direct primary care. His past military uh, service includes 11 years as a commission officer in the US Naval Reserve as a flight surgeon, and two years as a commission major in the US Army Reserve. Welcome to all three of you. We're very anxious for your comments. And I'd like to ask Mr. Reed to begin our panel discussion. Fine. Yeah, thank you, Beth. And hello, everybody. It's an honor for me to be on a panel with my friend Corey and with Dr. Bender. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the um, Healthcare Cost Analysis Task Force. This was a Colorado committee that was set up by the legislature to deal with a paradox in healthcare in Colorado, sort of an anomaly. Here's the thing, uh, we're doing great in Colorado on healthcare for most of us. Uh, almost all Coloradans get excellent care in excellent hospitals. We have two fine health uh, medical schools, a well-respected school of public health, the Commonwealth Fund is a research organization in New York. They say Colorado ranks sixth in the nation in terms of overall health. Hawaii came in first. Uh, we were the healthiest of all the Rocky Mountain states. Um, millions of Coloradans are getting great care in fine hospitals. So what's the problem? Well, there are two problems here. One is a lot of people are just left out of this excellent system. About 357,000 Coloradans have no health insurance. Another 700,000 or so are what we call underinsured, which means they pay the premium every month, but the copay and the deductible is so high, $6,000, $8,000 a year, that they really can't afford to go to the doctor when they're sick. So these people don't really get health care until they're sick enough to go to the emergency room. And then another problem is those of us who do get care, are paying through the nose for it. According to the Commonwealth Fund, hospital fees in Colorado are higher than in 40 other states for standard hospital operations, knee replacement, hernia repair, delivering a baby. We pay more than New Yorkers, Florida, Illinois, California. And so this task force was set up by the legislature to see what we could do about those problems, try to get healthcare for everybody 
and get some control over costs. And the main thing we did was we hired a team of experts at the school, of Colorado School of Public Health to look at different models for providing health care for everybody. And basically, they came back with two proposals for how we could get universal coverage. One was kind of a mixed system where people who are currently on private insurance or Medicare or the Indian Health Service or whatever they're on uh, would stay on that. And then the 350,000 people with no insurance would be covered by a new government program. Um, and this would work. This would cover everybody, but it had some problems. One, it's incredibly complicated. It would mean, uh, you know, we already have hundreds of different insurance plans. Ask our doctors how complicated that is. You don't know who to bill or how much they're going to pay you. Uh, this would just add complexity to a complex system. And that mixed system of coverage actually would increase costs. It would cost more than what we're paying now. And then our experts looked at another model, which was a, a government plan, a government insurance plan that provided health insurance for everybody up to age 65. So the insurance would be a public plan. The providers, the docs, the hospitals, the labs, the drug companies, et cetera, would remain private, would be the same private docs and hospitals we're going to now. And guess what? Under that proposal, that is the government plan, government insurance plan, we would get everybody covered. We get better overall health. We would increase state employment. We would reduce medical bankruptcies to zero. And get this, we'd save billions of dollars every year for the state and for individual citizens through lower costs and lower premiums. So. Here's a, here's a proposal that would solve the problem. It would cover everybody. It would improve health, improve employment, and save billions of dollars. Now, it seems to me every member of the state legislature would like to save his or her constituents' money and improve our state's health. And here, a group of experts at our School of Public Health have come up with a way to do it. So my suggestion is, Let's go legislature, we got the solution, let's do it. Uh, and I have one minute left and there are two more things I wanna say. One member of this uh, statewide task force was Senator Denal and she, my recommendation would be, if you ever have to set up a committee or a blue ribbon commission or a task force, put Senator Denal on it because she was just a calm, logical force of common sense throughout all our meetings, I was so impressed. And then the second thing was we polled Coloradans. We had a, uh, two or three statewide meetings. We had to do it by Zoom because of COVID. And we did a poll. And here's what we found. We found 94% of Coloradans think everybody should have health insurance. And guess what? They don't give a darn. They don't care a bit whether it's private insurance or public insurance. They just want decent insurance at a reasonable price, 94%. But well, you know, what bothered me about that was 6% of our respondents said they think healthcare is a commodity. It's a luxury good. If you're sick and you have the money to pay a doctor, fine. And if not, tough luck. 6% of the people in our state felt that. But most Coloradans want to see everybody get health insurance. And our experts showed us that we could do it and save billions of dollars along the way. Pretty good result. So let's get cracking, legislators. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reen. Uh, Dr. Carroll. Great. I will share my slides now, and uh, I'm going to do my best to keep as close on time as possible. So I will be uh, arguing for this concept of Medicare for all, but I'm not going to do it based on my belief system or my feelings. It's based on evidence and data. Um, there we go. So the one thing I really like about the uh, program, uh, unlike uh, if you're employed, not employed, if you're moving to a different state, the Medicare is yours. And it doesn't matter if you're married, if you're, uh, again, uh, depending on your status, doesn't waste your money as TR mentioned. And you actually live longer and you get better health, huh? Interesting concepts. 
So um, here is the overhead that we are seeing the private insurance companies use to manage their plan. And here is the uh, corresponding traditional Medicare. Now, does this mean that the private companies are doing a better job? No, this means that they are taking money that premiums are paid for in healthcare and they're distributing to their shareholders and CEOs where the traditional Medicaid, Medicare does not. So that's one of them. I put in this slide because there's this argument, well, we should let the companies make money. And I agree, but this is a graph showing Fortune 500 median profits going back to 1995, comparing that to the drug companies. So even in the capitalistic market, pharmaceutical industries are just doing fabulous. What does that mean for their shareholders and their CEOs? Good, 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 good. What does it mean for patients to try to afford drugs? It's a problem. As TR mentioned, there are numerous studies that say this makes sense in America. And again, you see an increased cost of utilization if everybody's covered, but you see savings when you start making it simple and you create systems to help manage the, the complexity of medicine without the, uh, all the nuance of the insurance company and the different plans and how it works. So this is a fascinating study from the Institute of Medicine showing ranking Americans to other first world countries. You see at the bottom, if you could read it, we're talking Australia, uh, Austria, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Norway. So we're not you know, talking about Ethiopia. We're talking United Kingdom, Netherlands. This is where we rank until we hit 65. And then our ranking improves, not because we're getting healthier, but we have a better healthcare system that is covering more of our needs. Thus, we have better outcomes. Here's the distribution of countries that have uh, some form of universal health care. Again, this is not like the U.S. has the best plan. We're looking at everybody. TR did that in his, in his work marvelously. The U.S. stands alone when it comes to first world countries and taking care of its patients, its, its citizens. So this is, I'm going to rush through this pretty quickly. I apologize for the uh, commentator, but TR could go into this much more detail, but here's four basic plans. Again, the National Health Service, public funding, public delivery, socialized medicine, the national health insurance, public funding, privately delivered, Medicare for all, a Bismarck all payer, that's Germany and others, mixed funding, private delivery, highly regulated nonprofit, uh, the Affordable Care Act on a uh, similar process, and then the USA on the bottom. So here's some statistics, coverage of the population, uh, even the systems that don't have uh, the universal and, and uh, uh, national service, they are way far ahead than the United States of America. Primary care physicians, this is per 1,000 citizens, they have more primary care docs. Part of the reason is they recognize the value of primary care and they pay primary care. In the United States of America, we're ranked down at 0.3 per thousand people. Life expectancy, once again, this would be something you would think if America had the breast spreader system, we'd be way out in front, we're not. Males, same dilemma. Down at 76% where other countries that men are living longer, up to 80 years, four years longer. One area we do exceed is cost. And this is frustrating when you look at the outcome data and then you look at the money, kind of like the insurance overhead. What is happening? We're not getting better health care. We're just having a system take the money and profit. So socialized medicine is 70% less expensive than the U.S. Other results are excellent. Medicare for all, 50% less expensive. Uh, the, Ameri the Affordable Care Act on steroids, 40%. So you can see the more you move to a a full you know, socialized system, the more savings you have. Um, but here in the United States, we decide we wanna keep it in a very dysfunctional and I would argue terrible place. Fascinating data here, 1971, there was a decision in the United States to implement um, HMO, why? To control costs. What did Canada do? They expanded Medicare for all 
of the uh, all of the population. So here's the, the data showing uh, the cost of the GDP based on the year. And look what happened when we passed the HMO Act. Nothing. It kept going up and up and up. Here's Canada's data. Not only did they take care of all their, their citizens, they lowered their costs based on GDP. So we have this tax that we're paying just so we get kind of healthcare. And as TR mentioned, and Dr. Bender will mention, many of us will get wonderful healthcare, but there's a large number of Americans that aren't getting healthcare. So frustrating me is that if you go, if you're in Canada, you spend half as much, you have fewer unmet health needs, and you live three years longer. Sorry, TR, I had to do this, but this, this guy has beautiful work. Look at this Sick Around the World documentary, the books. Um, he goes into much more detail. And again, I like looking at the evidence and the data rather than just saying we're, we're number one, because we're not. Frustrating for docs and one of the, the con concerns for, for me certainly is when patients come to me without insurance and they need help and they can't afford it. I don't think I have time for two examples, but I'll tell you it happens all the time. Doctors in America aren't happy. Germany is worse, but the other countries are better. Here's the other myth. Doctors are, um, move, are, are leaving Canada and going, no, American physicians are actually moving to Canada. And this data is showing based in 2004, 2006, the doctors that left Canada are coming back home. My final kind of statement. Uh, yes, I am now 65 as of a couple of weeks ago. I'm on Medicare. I basically selected traditional Medicare. I have a Medigap policy and a Part D. Uh, my deductible dropped by two grand and I have better coverage than I did with my private plan that my wife had at CSU. Now, um, I trust that my colleagues will take care of me on Medicare. I trust my colleagues will take care of everybody on Medicare. It may create a little bit of a disruptive system, but the, the winds are amazing. So I really support helping Americans, helping our citizens that are in trouble and getting them into a much, much better system. And that would be a universal health care, Medicare for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Dr. Bender. Okay. Start my timer here. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, uh, Senator Janelle and and distinguished uh, representatives for uh, hosting us today. So um, I titled my uh, presentation just a fact check, and I I'm not going to say here as a naysayer that you can't have Medicare for all. I'm going to demonstrate some of the challenges that need to be overcome, and these need to be taken very, very seriously. So a little bit about myself. I'm from Colorado, 1973 uh, until now. I was gone for some military service. When I returned in 2000, I started building uh, medical clinics up and down the front range. And I really wanted to get into rural areas. I love rural Colorado and uh, we opened clinics uh, and started growing uh, fourth fastest growing uh, clinic or company in Larimer County for a while. And we rode this Medicaid uh, expansion wave because we, we accepted Medicaid. And we also started offering innovative programs for direct primary care for people without insurance. We were recognized nationally for our IT implementation, named Patient Center Medical Home of the Year when, when no one else was a Patient Center Medical Home. Uh, and then my peers uh, um, elected me uh, as president of the Carl Mack Society and ultimately a Physician of the Year. Started working on some bills, dealing with immunization, telehealth, uh, with uh, medical uh, marijuana, and with the direct primary care. Uh, and uh, um, and, and thank you, uh, Senator Janelle and others, for, for all your hard work on those projects. Those were very important for Colorado Health. Now, I'm, I'm going to just lay out three fallacies. And, and the first fallacy is this concept, this idea that U.S. healthcare is bad because other industrialized nations appear to have better outcome metrics. And we've heard this from the other speakers. Let's look at one of them. This is the LPI, the Legatum Prosperity Index. So here you'll see the Legatum Prosperity Index and shows Denmark's number one, Norway's number two, Switzerland's number three. And we come all the way down and, and poor United States, we're number 18 here, way, way below all of our peers as, as Dr. Carol eloquently showed. Now the fallacy here is it's a false equivalency. I would point out that the first 
17 nations on the LPI index have a combined, an aggregate population of 303 million people, not even as large as the U.S. at 334 million people. We are a third of a billion people, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And when you compare us to other nations our size, you'll see you've got Indonesia, Pakistan, Brazil. There are no other nations on that first 17 list. Japan is here. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, they're, they're one third our size, but they were number 19 on the LPI index. And so when you start comparing us to countries our size, uh, you, you have to look at Indonesia, Pakistan, Brazil, possibly China and India. And, and when the World Health data and others compile it, and we compare ourselves to nations our size, we have exceptional health care compared to Pakistan, Indonesia, India, and China. So I would just ask that we pick on someone our own size and tr stop trying to lump the United States in with a country like Norway that has 5 million people and is barely the size of Colorado. The second fallacy is that Medicare for all will include everyone. We've tried this, and, and I'll show you here in a minute, and it, and it did not work. It's not going to include Medicaid. It's not going to include TRICARE. It's not going to include the Indian Health Service. It's not going to include the Veterans Administration. You say, well, Bender, how can you be so bold as to say it won't include them? Well, just try abolishing these services and roll them into Medicare now. You will quickly find that that is not a workable solution. The truthful answer is that big government already tried this, and when they've tried it in the past, they failed badly. The federal government found no cost benefits or administrative simplification when it took steps last decade to roll Medicaid into Medicare. So under the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid rates were made equal to Medicare rates for primary care. And this was great news for providers like myself. I said, hey, we, we are able to be sustainable on Medicare. Let's go ahead and take Medicaid. So we expanded to 7,000 new Medicaid patients. And within two years, the US Congress said, you know what, we can't afford this. It's an appropriation, they stopped. Governor Hickson was the step up and said, you know what, state of Colorado is gonna continue to pay for this. And they did for two more years. And then the state of Colorado ran out and they said, we're not going to do it either. And with about six weeks notice, they told us that we were now going to get a pay cut from a dollar on a dollar down to 79 cents on the dollar. And it killed primary care here in Colorado. What happened is a lot of people now had Medicaid cards because we went from one in 10 people having a Medicaid card to almost one in, in four, but they couldn't have a doctor. There was no doctors accepting these benefits. Don't take my word for it. Look at the Longmont Times call. Planned Parenthood closed six regional offices in 2017 over this fiasco. And you can read the article yourself. I included the link. But if we ask the um, uh, Whitney Phillips, who is the spokesperson from Planned Parenthood, she says, hey, we support the ACA. We love the idea of everyone having health insurance. But a lot of our patients previously were self-pay. They would come in, they'd get a pap smear, they'd pay out of pocket. Under the ACA, a lot of patients were given the opportunity to be on Medicaid. That's wonderful. But it meant that rather than bill them directly, we had to bill Medicaid. And Medicaid reimburses at a very low rate. In other words, the poor people that were going to Planned Parenthood were willing to pay more out of pocket for those primary care services than the state of Colorado was willing to pay. In other words, the poor people recognized the value of primary care, but when given the realm that they helmed, the state of Colorado did not. The state of Colorado said, we're going to do price controls. We're going to we're going to shortcut what we're paying the supplier. And the consequence was we lost six Planned Parenthood. Um, in Colorado, the largest provider of drug and alcohol rehab was Arapaho House. They bankrupted because of this failed Medicaid fiasco of trying to make Medicaid like Medicare. And again, don't take my word for it. You can read about this in the Denver Post. And this happened at the worst possible time when there was a fentanyl overdose epidemic, which continues to this day. And many behavioral health providers have gotten out of providing care for Medicaid because the state simply will not pay them as much as the poor people were willing to pay themselves. In the private sector, I operated clinics up and down the front range. I had the only medical clinic in Park County, Colorado. I had the only clinic in Wellington for about eight years. I had the only clinic in Red Feather Lakes, and that's the last time Red Feather Lakes has had a clinic. And I opened a West Loveland Medicaid clinic here in Larimer County that was mostly Medicaid. And when the cuts came, I had to close every single one of them. I went from 100 employees down to 70. We had 7,000 people lose their doctor. Again, read the flume out of fair play. It says the Miramont Family Medicine Clinic was the lifeline for the community. 
when it closed in June of, um, back in 2014, it was like the heart of medical care was torn out of Park County. And, and so we had 10,000 new people in Park County, Colorado that now had a Medicaid card and there was not a single doctor in the entire county. The, the policies drove Miramont out when we had this government takeover and, and, and it just did not work. Fallacy number three is that Medicare for all will be run by the government. Well, it turns out it's not run by the government. It's run through Medicare Advantage and PBM. And the big insurers, Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare, they love it because they make way more money on a Medicare Advantage patient than they do in the individual group markets. I know Corey Carroll showed you it's more expensive. I disagree. When we look at uh, a company like United Health Group that's making $1,600 per Medicare beneficiary, as opposed to only $779 the individual or $855 in the group market, why in heaven's name would we want to give them all of the, the individual and group markets as a Medicare Advantage program? That's only going to add more weight. And you could say, well, we won't have Medicare Advantage in our Medicare for all. All righty, well, I'll leave it to you to tell grandma that we're taking away her Medicare Advantage plan, I am not so bold. Medicare for all is potentially a threatened takeover of the entire healthcare sector. It will create insatiable demand as it did in Park County where 10,000 people now had a card. But by driving out suppliers as it did with primary care in Colorado, uh, there will be a mismatch between supply and demand. Medicare cannot control costs because the governance structures insulate from corrective marketplace forces and political forces that reduce waste. The reality is your hospitals do not want it. Small business doesn't want it. All the living former governors of Colorado do not advise it. Chambers of commerce do not want it. Republicans don't want it. And Democrats and independents are split. The truth is we need to reduce waste in healthcare. And when we do, there's enough left over for every man, woman, and child. Adding layers of government waste is not the solution. We have to do a fact check on primary, uh, on, on this uh, uh, um, proposal. So um, I'm just going to share a little bit of uh, data here quickly um, in the uh, half minute that I remain. Uh, I offer a program called Direct Primary Care. I have 1,300 patients that have no health insurance that join me like a gym. They pay $75 a month. You can see the program has been very successful and you'll notice here in 2017, it suddenly took a big dip. The reason is HICPUP came out and said, you know what? If people have Medicaid, we're not going to let them enroll in direct primary care, Dr. Bender. We disenrolled 160 people who had Medicaid and yet still were able to find our prices were a little lower than I think it was $59 a month. They still were able to find the $59 a month. And people would say to me, well, how can a poor person afford $59 a month? They said, well, they're making a value decision. You know, they, they aren't buying their, their you know, if this person was a, a drug addict, a heroin addict, because I have 130 heroin addicts that I care for, they are able to um, get their Suboxone to their Medicaid benefit. I can't afford to see them under Medicaid, but they're willing to pay me 59 a month. When this policy came out, we had to disenroll those individuals. People were driving to me from, from Denver. I still have people from out of state, by the way. I have patients with Wyoming Medicaid and South Dakota Medicaid that drive to see me but I cannot see Colorado Medicaid under the failed policies of our state. And so we have to give consideration about how implementing this could really crush primary care as it has already done in our state uh, in years past. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bender. And thanks to all three of our panelists, a very thought provoking uh, set of remarks. We're now going to open it up to questions. And as I indicated at the start, you can either type your question into the chat function or uh, raise your virtual hand via the reaction button at the bottom of your screen. There's one question that has come in, and I'll, I'll offer this up to all three of our panelists. What can the state of Colorado accomplish towards universal health care without the support of the federal government? Would well, someone like to... I can answer that. Um, okay. In the Affordable Care Act, there's a clause in the in the Obamacare, it's the Affordable Care Act, uh, that sets up a waiver system where any state that can come up with a system that covers more people than are currently covered under the Affordable Care Act can get a waiver and set up its own system. 
we would have to so apply to the uh, Federal Department of Health and Human Services. Um, they've indicated that uh, they would be receptive to such a proposal from a state. One state, Massachusetts, has gotten a waiver. We could get it too, but we would have to get a waiver from the federal government. As long as our system covered more people, that is provided more coverage, um, we could get that waiver. In my view, being as good as Pakistan is not the right goal for the world's richest, most powerful country. We should be as good as the other advanced capitalistic democracies around the world and cover everybody. And we could do that and would get a waiver from the federal government, but we'd have to apply for that to the HHS. Any other quickly, comments on that? I'll, I'll quickly throw in, you know, the, the whole concept of Medicare was created because of in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, as individuals aged, they got sicker and there was no coverage for them. And they were the poorest section of America. It was, you know, you can go back to, to Roosevelt who said, we need to have universal health care. And you can, even Reagan pointed it out. Um, Linda Johnson passed Medicare in 1965, not because it's just a fun thing to do because we had people dying and having terrible uh, outcomes. And here's the fascinating concept. When Medicare came into existence, elderly people all of a sudden had the safety net. Guess what it did? It gave them better health care, but it took the burden off their children so the children could have a two-person income. It actually increased wealth in this nation. So without that, that program, you know, Ronald Reagan was famously quoted saying, it's gonna destroy America, socialized medicine. It did nothing of the like. It actually helped America. It helped our elderly. They're now the most wealthy group. And I'll guarantee you it's because of the health care benefits of Medicare. I think another area where we could really uh, continue to show innovation is by not over-regulating primary care. Primary care is regulated at levels that are just unconscionable. I'll give you some quick examples. Um, we have robotic vending machines in my office. They are way cool. Uh, there is no 24-hour uh, pharmacy in Larimer County, but I have a 24-hour robotic prescription vending machine at my Drake office. Uh, we keep the outer doors to the building unlocked. The inner vestibule doors are open, and at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, I can send any one of you there. You can swipe a credit card and pick up your amoxicillin. I've been back to the state probably six times in the last 20 years trying to get permission for the state Medicaid program to pay for my prescriptions. They say, well, are you a pharmacist? I say, no. They say, we won't pay for them. Now, meanwhile, they're, they're willing to let pharmacists start giving vaccines or let pharmacists start dispensing insulin without a prescription or let pharmacists do lab testing in the, in the pharmacy. That's okay. We have to stop picking winners and losers in the marketplace. We have to stop demonizing primary care. We need to say, you know what? Primary care really needs to be supported. Let's loosen these regulations and let them go at it. And, and you know, I, I gave the same pitch and, and one, of, one of the people on the health and services committee uh, two years ago told me that I couldn't see the vulnerabilities of poor people and that that would not be a good idea. I mean, that's a ridiculous comment to someone who built clinics in rural Colorado and had 7,000 Medicaid patients. I have a passion for helping and innovating in these areas. We should not be stifled. Please deregulate primary care. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Madeline Jacobs, your hand is raised. Thank you. Um, I, I actually was doc in rural area for 30 years down here in Fremont County. Um, and I actually trained in Fort Collins and I believe I've actually met you, Dr. Bender, back when, when I was doing that. Um, I, I have some concerns about some of your comments, and if this is delayed, please, I'm actually have to turn off my video because I have rural internet. So there are some things that you say that are true, but there's a lot that you say that really rub me the wrong way. And my underlying issue with the healthcare system is that the goal of the current system in the United States is profit. And the way they do that is to collect premiums, charge extra charges like co-pays and deductibles, and uh, deny care. And that's what the middlemen, the profiteering middlemen do. 
Um, and so what we need is a system whose goal is health care. And that is something that improved Medicare for all would allow. Um, the goal of those types of systems is to provide care. Anytime there's a comparison of what we have now, which is the profiteering and privateing, privatizing of Medicare, is a false premise as to what we are looking for for improved Medicare for all. It's also a false premise to say either the population is too big or the population is too small to do that. And in fact, that is what the profiteers argue. Um, if you have an increasing population, you'll have an increasing financial base. And you also will have the ability to um, cover everyone. Thank you. And sorry, that's not a question, it's just a comment. <laughs> Any reactions to Dr. Jacobs' comments? Well, I would just point out, we do not profiteer off of people. I mean, a naysayer would say that every physician, uh, you know, profits off of, uh, you know, sickness and, and, and disease, and, and that's just not true. I went into healthcare to help people to, to heal and to transform lives, and we do that very effectable, effectively. My company's an ESOP. I have 70 employees. We're employee-owned. You know, we have innovated in ways that, that have kept us fiercely independent. I have decided not to be part of a big hospital system. Uh, you know, you see health, I see waste, all right? Or as I call it, you see wealth. We talked about, uh, you know, just, just the escalating cost of healthcare. We bend over backwards at Miramont to keep people out of the hospital. On my employees' badges, nowhere will you see call 911. We tell everyone, in case of emergency, sorry, that's blurred out. It says, in case of emergency, call me. And if I, I don't care if you think you're dying, I tell people, you come in and see me. We'll start your IV, we do your chest x-ray, we do your lab work, we start your antibiotics. If it looks like you have pneumonia, I don't send you to the ER. I call a hospitalist at UC Health and I say, I want to direct admit this person. And if they say no, I say, well, I'm going to call Banner. And then they go, oh, okay, yeah, we'll go ahead and take him, Dr. Bender. I can paradoxically get someone from my office into the hospital in a bed in about two hours time. You go through the ER, it's seven hours. So there are things we can do to innovate to help drive down the cost of healthcare. But my hands are tight. There are so many rules and regulations that just paralyze me. It's not a free market. Don't tell me the free market doesn't work. It's an extremely restrictive market. And that's part of what is driving the craziness. I had just a few seconds and I sure. agree with Dr. Bender on the Medicaid issue. I would love to have Medicaid patients in my direct primary care, but the, the rules say no. Um, that's absolutely insane. And I agree, um, regulation is down, is a bad thing as, it, when it goes on. But one of the unique things about Dr. Bender, he is amazing. He has these clinics, he has these systems. I don't. And you know, my you know, you know, capacity to take care of patients, I do not have the capacity to start an IV. So when you look across the system, you have, you know, you have to have these entities such as emergency rooms and hospitals and, and, and clinics. Um, the question is how do we how do we fund it? And again, the, the for-profit system is, uh, you know, the, the, the last thing I'll say quickly is that, you know, yes, I, I make an income taking care of patients. Um, I expect to, but I don't have shareholders. I don't pay other people from my profits. And that's the difference with the United States system compared to everybody else. Um, it's not, you know, not that everybody's perfect, but yes, I pay myself and my staff, but I don't have to get more to pay the shareholders. Thank you. I have a question here from Luke Whitcomb. Dr. Bender argued that reducing waste within our current system is the only tenable means of lowering healthcare costs and improving coverage. Can you provide data-driven, feasible examples of policy changes to ensure this will happen in Colorado? <laughs> Was that directed to me? It, it can be, Dr. Bender. Yeah, any of you. Well, well, I mean, for example, you know, my, my direct primary care uh, costs, I charge people about uh, $700 a year to, drive, to join our membership program. I, I think it's crazy to have the health insurance for primary care. I didn't really touch on this in my slide deck, but having primary care insurance is like trying to have grocery insurance. Everyone needs groceries. Could you imagine going to the grocery store and them telling you, well, you can't have a steak. You've got to have hot dogs because that's the only thing that's approved. Um, everyone needs primary care. The only reason to have insurance is for things that don't have 100% probability of occurring. 
Uh, not everyone is going to have a baby this year. Not everyone's going to need their appendix out. Not everyone's going to need cancer chemotherapy. We should be ensuring specialty care. We should not be ensuring primary care. I tell people, treat car insurance or treat health insurance like you do car insurance. So you change your tires, you put fuel in your car, you wash your car, you change your oil, you budget about $700 a year for your car. And then once every seven years, when you're in a car wreck, you file a claim and then you, then you have to kind of eat that deductible. That's what we should be doing with these high deductible plans. We know that uh, half, you know, economists tell us half of all Americans don't have 6,000 in savings. So if you have a $6,000 deductible, that's already a bankrupting. Uh, and, and the purpose of insurance is not to give you access, right? We already talked about how that didn't work in fair play. It's to protect your assets. And so that if you end up with an appendectomy, you don't get a $50,000 bill that banks are up to you. You get a $6,000 deductible bill and maybe you can take out a loan and pay for it. But my, my recommendation to people is buy the cheapest bronze plan you can, then buy, buy the insurance for your coverage, but buy me for your care. And just budget $700 a year for your body, just like you do for your car. I will keep you out of the emergency rooms. I'll keep you out of the urgent cares. I'll keep you from seeing a specialist uh, for, for outpatient things. You know, if you need a heart cath, you're going to go to the hospital. But if you need medicines for your atrial fibrillation, I'll do that, not a cardiologist. Thank well, you. actually, leaving 350,000 people in our state with no health insurance adds to our cost. It doesn't save us any money. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say a, a, a part-time clerk in a convenience store, no health insurance, feels a vague pain in the right side of her abdomen. Uh, you know, it costs her 120 bucks to go to the doctor. She's not going to go to the doctor for that. <clears throat> Um, three months later, she's in the emergency room with a burst appendix that costs us $30,000. If she could have gone to the doctor when she first felt that pain, he could have treated that infection for 120 bucks. So when we leave people without health insurance, not only are we letting people stay sick and die whom we could help, we're costing ourselves a lot of money. We would save a ton of money, as the experts at the Colorado School of Public Health said, if we provided health care for everybody and some kind of Medicare for all plan turns out to be the most efficient way to do that. Uh, Corey Carroll's data show that the private insurance companies have administrative costs in the range of 18 to 20 percent. Medicare's are two and a half percent. Thank you. We probably have time for one more question. Uh, Eleanor Christensen, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm, I've had the unique experience of working in a single payer universal health care plan here in Colorado, in Denver. The University of Denver established a single payer universal health plan for all their students in 1947. They did it because they didn't want any student dropping out of their expensive school because of an unexpected medical bill. What a concept. It worked beautifully. It was simple. It was cost effective. And um, before I retired in 1985, the student government awarded the Student Health Service with their Outstanding Service Award, the ultimate compliment. It can be done. It was primary care that we delivered to all the undergraduate students, all the graduate students, all the foreign students. And it was very inexpensive. You don't have to have a national plan to do it and do it well. We did it at University of Denver since 1947. And my after I retired in 85, my successor allowed students to opt out of the plan if they could prove they had comparable coverage through their parents. The cost of the plan tripled because of the added administrative waste of having to handle claims from multiple insurance companies instead of one plan that covered everyone with comprehensive benefits. If anyone would like to learn more about it, please contact me. Thank you, Eleanor. Any comments about Eleanor's uh, remarks? Okay. Well, we've got about five minutes left and I wanna leave some time for our uh, elected officials and presenters to offer some final comments. I apologize, we didn't get to all your questions today. It's a very, uh, it, it, and I, it, you know, uh, hopefully we'll find a way to respond to some of the questions that you've put in chat. 
So with that, uh, Mr. Reed, can I ask you to give some brief closing remarks? Yes, thank you. Uh, when I was on the cost analysis task force, as I said, we hired these experts. They came back and said, hey, we could solve the problem. We could cover everybody, improve healthcare, and save billions of dollars. And I said, whoa, we are going to be heroes. The legislators are going to love us. We solved the big problem in Colorado and saved everybody billions of dollars. And some more politically savvy members of the task force said, no, no, we're going to be bumped. They're going to hate us. Because if we propose a system that saves money and covers everybody, the insurers and the hospital and big pharma pharmaceutical companies will fight against it and they'll be in trouble. And was that prediction accurate? I mean, here we have presented an expert plan, solve a problem, save billions, and it's gone nowhere in the legislature. Why would that be? Thank you. Dr. Carroll? Complex. Um, I think the point I uh, make, and this is where Dr. Bender and I disagree, is, is I actually went to Canada with the concept of maybe moving there because of the, the issue. I don't see other countries saying, oh, this is a bad system. I don't, you know, you'll have those unique situations where somebody says, oh, I had to wait, you know, three months, six months for a hip replacement, but that happens in the United States. And if you don't have insurance, you don't get your hip replaced. Um, and I have countless, I mean, I, I, I took them out of my slide deck because I didn't have time, but I had two examples this week of terrible situations where people needed healthcare, but they were afraid to go. Um, so when I look at the data, when I look at my uh, colleagues in other countries, I just have to say, you know, we don't have the best system. I love the innovation. I love the thoughts. And, and if, if we can create, you know, that movement, wonderful, it's going to be tough because the losers in a single payer of Medicare for all are gonna be people that are right now making tons of money and they're not gonna go away without a fight. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bender? Well, again, I wanna thank everyone for your time. This has been a very fun and uh, invigorating uh, discussion. Um, I, I'm not adamantly opposed to Medicare for all. Obviously, I, I set out some challenges of things that have to be fixed. My biggest concern is that if this became the law of Colorado tomorrow, is that within two to three years, I would start to see my reimbursements tank and I would be told, well, you can't charge people extra money on the side, you can't do DPC, and the regulation would just would just quash primary care. And suddenly we'd look around and say, well, we have everyone covered, but we have uh, 22 counties without a physician. And so I guess it's kind of meaningless. So think about what we're going to do to ensure that we have the strongest primary care workforce. Without the strongest primary workforce in Colorado, you, you cannot make this happen. It becomes uh, just a, a talking point of, well, we've got everyone covered, but we still have lousy health care. Thank you. Thank you. And now closing remarks from our legislators, Representative Kip. Um, Thank you to all of our panelists for this invigorating discussion today. You know what I want to do? I want to lock the three of you in a room and get you all your brilliant minds together to solve this problem. But really, thank you. I think you all, all have really um, interesting, thought-provoking ideas. So thank you so much for that. Thank you to Beth for being our um, excellent, excellent moderator. And thank you to all of us for taking the time to join us today. Just really appreciate you. Thank you. Representative Basenecker. Yes, I would echo uh, Representative Kipp's remarks. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists and for the outstanding discussion. You know, I always learn so much on these um, incredibly valuable issue forums, and uh, I'm just so grateful that our community was able to join as well uh, and um, get a, just a taste for the uh, immense amount of experience and expertise in this um, healthcare space that our panelists were able to provide. So thank you uh, for all of your efforts in keeping people healthy in our community. and. Um, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to connect with each of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Young. Well, I reiterate the thanks to the panelists and really provoking information that um, I'm, I'm hoping maybe you could send us the slides so I, I can mull over them and hope I can reach out to you with further questions. As I said, I'm a Medicare recipient and this has provoked more questions for me. So thank you, Beth, and thank you for all of the people who joined us today. Great, thank you. Representative Amabile. Yes, thank you. I, I mean, I'll say thank you to everybody also. 
And I feel like I've learned a lot today. And I just want to, I'm new, to, relatively new in the legislature, not as new as Rep. Basenecker, but <laughs> almost. And um, so your question about why don't we just do it is a good one. But also in my short time there, I have learned that we chip away at things. We don't blow things up in the legislature because it's really hard to get enough support to blow things up. So I think a lot of our colleagues have really worked on chipping away at things and will continue to do so. And, you know, uh, the big blow up often happens after you've chipped away at enough things to really reveal the truth about what should happen. And maybe we're on a path to do that right now. I'm, I'm not sure, but I really appreciate the conversation and everybody being here. Thank you. Senator Janal. Yes, thank you to everyone. I think we broke a record here with the number of participants today. Thank you very much for showing up. I, I think healthcare is extremely important and you're showing me right now with all the people that are on this call with our three uh, panelists. I really thank you all. You are wonderful friends and colleagues. And um, I just, I wanna say, this is stimulating conversation. It makes you think. And that is one of the reasons why I had T.R. Reed, Dr. Bender, and Dr. Carroll all present today because their viewpoints are similar yet different and thought provoking. Uh, T.R., uh, you just gave a report to the health committees, uh, I believe, in January. So hold on. Okay. Something may be brewing for next session. Okay. Um, and also to Dr. Carroll and to Dr. Bender, I would like to share with you uh, uh, something I would like you to weigh in on, on a primary care bill I'm bringing forward this session. It's going to be a little late, but it's coming. Um, and I want to share it with you. But I think this was an invigorating conversation. And I appreciate you all. Um, and healthcare is, to me, the most important thing, because if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for joining us today. It was a very thought-provoking discussion and appreciate everybody's time. I hope you all have a great Saturday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>